Praise the Lord. All right, so we're going to continue. The second lesson in the one that I've entitled The Integrity of the Word is going back to Mark chapter 4, and we're going to look at this parable about the sower sowing the seed. I mentioned this in the previous hour, but this is the one that Mark chapter 4 verse 13 says, if you don't understand this parable, you can't understand any parable. So to me, this is like the Rosetta Stone. You know, today, if you use the word Rosetta Stone, people think of that language program. But that's not what the Rosetta Stone is. The Rosetta Stone was, you know, when they found all of the Egyptian stuff and all of this hieroglyphics for about, I don't know how many years, but for decades, nobody knew what the hieroglyphics were until they found out what they call the Rosetta Stone. And the Rosetta Stone had three different languages, the exact same thing said in three different languages. And two of the languages were known languages, but the third one was uh, hieroglyphics. And so they were able to interpret hieroglyphics and it was the key that unlocked everything and opened it all up at the Rosetta Stone. So um, anyway, this is like the Rosetta Stone of all of Jesus' teachings. If you can't understand this teaching, you can't understand any of it. That's how important this is. So in the first part of this chapter, just for time's sake, I'm going to summarize it, but he talked about a man who just scattered seed. Again, he didn't dig furrows and plant them, but he just had a bag of seed and he would walk along and just throw seed like this. And the seed landed on four different types of ground. And the first type of ground was a ground that was, um, it was hard packed and the seed never penetrated the ground. It just lay on top of the ground and the birds of the air came and ate it. The second type of ground was a ground where the seed did have some, some, uh, some soil, but it was rocky and it didn't have enough depth of earth. And so the seed sprang up, but it died before it could produce fruit. The third type of ground was a type of ground where there was a lot of thorns and briars and other things, and it choked the seed, and the seed didn't bring forth its full fruit. It had some fruit, but it never came to maturity. And then the fourth type of ground was a type of ground that brought forth uh, fruit 30, 60, and 100 fold. And so that's the parable. And then his disciple says, why are you talking to him in parables? And he began to explain some things, and there's some great truths in there, but I'm not going to deal with that. And so he said again in Mark chapter 4, verse 13, he says, Know ye not this parable? How then will ye know all parables? And then in verse 14, he began to give his interpretation of this parable. And he says in verse 14, The sower sows the word. That's what we talked about in the last hour. And I've made that point. It's so significant that he chose a seed because you can't cheat on a seed. You have to plant it, you have to give it time, you have to give it nourishment, you have to give it the right temperature, all of these kind of things. You can't violate this system. They are laws that work. And then in verse 15, he begins to interpret these four different types of ground. In verse 15, he says, these are they by the wayside where the word is sown, but when they have heard, Satan cometh immediately and taketh away the word that was sown in their hearts. If you go back in, these, in this chapter and look at the first type of ground, it says in verse 4, It came to pass, as he sowed, some fell by the wayside, and the fowls of the air came and devoured it up. This is what he's describing. And this is talking about a wayside is like a path. It's where the ground had been hard packed, and because of it, the seed never penetrated. It never got down in the soil and Satan came, the, the birds of the air just came and stole the word away, stole the seed away, and it never even had a chance to germinate. Now there's four different uh, soils here, and the soil are talking about the condition of people's hearts. There's four different stages of people's hearts, and the only one that Satan had total access to was the first one. He just came and stole it away. And it's because the seed never penetrated and went into their heart. Keep your finger here. I'm coming back. But look in Matthew chapter 13. And this same parable is given over here. And it says it just a little bit differently. In verse 19. Well, let's go back to verse 18. It says, Hear ye therefore the parable of the sower. When anyone heareth the word of the kingdom and understandeth it not, then cometh the wicked one and catcheth away that which was sown in his heart. This is he which receives seed by the wayside. So here's another way of saying this, that it's your understanding that 
determines whether the word ever begins to get past just your head and down into your heart. If you don't understand the word, then Satan has total access to come steal it from you. So the very first step in seeing the seed, the word of God work in your life is you've got to understand it. Now this is really, really important. And it's amazing to me how many ministers somehow or another don't understand this and they talk in ways that it, you have to sit there with a dictionary or a thesaurus or something to be able to listen to them. And they think that the higher language they speak in and, and use all of these things that somehow or another it's impressing people. And it may impress people, but the word will never take root in their heart unless it's presented in a way that you can understand it. You know, I was raised in a Baptist church that was a highfalutin Baptist church. And it was only just a few miles from the Southwestern Baptist Theological Seminary. And it's where all of the, you know, the theologians were. And so every time we had the pastor gone, the people that filled in the pulpit were these professors. And they would sit here and they, they love to just talk in terms and talk about all of the eschatology. And they would use these terms that, you know, nobody knew what they were talking about. But people would leave just impressed. Oh, aren't they so smart? But that's not going to set anybody free. You've got to speak in ways that people understand. This is, this is the logic behind children's church. You know, the Word is the Word. You don't change the truth, but you do have to present it in ways that people understand. If you're talking to a five-year-old and saying, now, if you don't do this, your marriage is never going to make it. <laughs> Did you know a five-year-old doesn't relate to that? They aren't going to understand what you're talking about. So you have to use examples and stuff that help them to understand. Understanding is super important. And that's one of the reasons I love the job that God gave me because as a teacher, this is what a teacher is all about. A preacher proclaims, a teacher explains. A preacher will sit there and, you know, it's God's will for you to be healed and he will get you all excited and running. But then, well, how do I do it? A teacher will teach you how to do things. And so this is really what God's called me to do. My whole ministry is about trying to help people to understand and receive the truth. Because if you don't understand it, Satan just comes immediately and steals away the word that was sown in your heart. And so it's super important that you understand. And um, boy, I could say a lot of things about this. Over in uh, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 17 and 18, it talks about don't be like the Gentiles who have no understanding. Their understanding is darkened being alienated from the life of God through the hardness of their heart and all of these kind of things. You, understanding is super important. And it's amazing how people just don't really put any effort into it. You know, when you went through school, not just Bible college here, but when you were in grade school and stuff like that, you have to apply yourself. It takes effort. You don't just normally understand math. You don't just normally understand grammar and things like this. It takes effort. You have to apply yourself and again, so many Christians are just praying, oh God, touch me. And they don't, they don't know anything. They don't know what the Word says. If that's you, you're going to have to get really good friends with somebody who does understand and let them help you. You're going to be dependent upon other people to help you the rest of your Christian life. But this is not where God wants you to live. God wants you to understand. He's given us an understanding that we may know Him that is true. God has given us an understanding. The Holy Spirit is sent to help you understand. If you read John 14, 15, and 16, four or five different times, the Holy Spirit will bring all things to your remembrance and teach you all things and lead you into all truth, John 14, 26. The Holy Spirit is sent to be your teacher, but you got to show up for class. Right. And the sad thing is most of us spend more time in the light of our TV than we do in the light of God's Word. And we just aren't showing up for class. We don't have understanding and we wonder why things aren't working. Right. This is one of Satan's big tools is to come and steal away the Word and it only happens to those who do not understand. So man, understanding is critical. In the book of Proverbs, it says, uh, 
Get wisdom with, and with all of your wisdom, get understanding. You know, knowledge is just information. You can put knowledge into a computer. You can put information into a computer, but a computer can't understand it. You can put information, like for instance, you could put all of the, uh, you know, spending that a corporation does or something into a computer and a computer can crunch numbers and it can tell you this department spent this much, this much. They can say that they were allotted this much money, but they didn't, they spent more than they were allotted. It can tell you facts, but it couldn't tell you whether it was because they were dishonest that they did this, whether it was misappropriation of funds. They can give you facts, but somebody with understanding would have to look at those facts to be able to know, was this a mistake or was this uh, fraud or something like that? You have to have uh, knowledge, but then you have to understand it. Otherwise, you're just nothing but like a computer. And God made us much, much more than that. And then wisdom is once you get the understanding, now what do I do with this? How do I deal with this problem? You know, I had a situation where the guy who set up our computer thing, this is way back in the beginning when we all had about like 15 employees or something. And this guy set up our computer and he was just a quality, quality guy and he was doing a great job and stuff. But all of a sudden he just got to where he was gone two or three hours a day. He'd be out for lunch for two hours and he had never done things like this before. And so I got information. I found out, was this an isolated thing or was he doing it on a regular basis? He was doing it nearly every day. He was missing out on two or three hours worth of work every day. So I got information and then I got understanding. And, but the wisdom was, how do I deal with this? How do I deal with this guy over this? And you know what? Instead of just going in and saying, you're wrong, and if you don't straighten up, we're going to fire you, which I had the right to do that because I was paying him for eight hours and he wasn't giving me eight hours. I had the right to do it, but you know what I did? I went in and I thought, this guy has been so faithful. He's worked overtime before, never said a word about it. What's going on? And so instead of coming in and cracking the whip on him, I just sat down and said, what's wrong with you? What's happened? He says, what do you mean? And I said, I've just noticed that you've been taking off two and three hours a day. You aren't doing your job the same as you used to. And I said, I just want to know what's going on. Why are you acting like this? This isn't the way that you've been. And he never did tell me what was going on. He says, well, I just would rather not tell you, but he says it'll never happen again. And it never did. And he straightened up. And I think what it was later on, he and his wife got a divorce. And I just think he was going through some hard times and he was having a hard time adjusting to it. But see, that's wisdom. You can take facts and sit there and you could just act on it, but it's wisdom about what do you do with these facts? Do you, is it, you know, there's a time to just be hard with a person, but there's a time to go in and operate in understanding. So there's knowledge, there's understanding, and then there's wisdom. Wisdom is the application of that knowledge with the correct understanding. So back in Mark chapter four, the first type of person, if you don't understand the word of God, there is no chance of the Word of God ever working in your life. It's not magic. You just don't lay this on top of your head and the Word works. You got to understand it. It's got to get through your brain. It's got to be, understand to be able, understood to be able to get down into your heart. Then the second type, and let me also say this, that I think that these uh, four different types of ground are progressive. I don't think that it's just like some people are like this, some are like this. I think all of us start in the place where we don't understand the things of God and we have to apply ourselves and gain understanding. And that leads us into this second type of ground. And then that goes into the third type and then into the fourth type. So I believe these are steps and stages that we go through. In verse 16, it says, and these are they likewise, which are sown on stony ground, who when they have heard the word immediately receive it with gladness and have no root in themselves and so endure but for a time. Afterward, when affliction or persecution ariseth for the word's sake, immediately they are offended. Man, there is a lot in those verses. I could preach for a week on those two verses. God has shown me so much through this. And you know, when the Lord first gave me a revelation of this uh, parable, this is exactly where I was. I was to the point that I began to understand some things but I didn't have any root in myself. And the way that the Lord revealed this to me, I was still in the Baptist church 
And I was trying to minister in the Baptist church. And long story, but man, I was just, uh, there was a lot of resistance, a lot of criticism. I was constantly being told that everything I was teaching was of the devil and stuff like this. And so what I'd do, I'd go over and hear Kenneth Copeland in Fort Worth. It was about an hour and something drive. I'd go over and hear him once a month. He had a three-day meeting for a year or something uh, once a month. And I'd go over and hear him and I'd get full of the word and I'd come back and I'd start preaching it in my Baptist church. And for the first week or two, it was good. I'd see healings. I'd see people healed. I'd see miracles happen. Things, it was great. But then after a week or two, all of the criticism against me, the affliction and persecution would come and I would still be saying the same things. I'd still be teaching on the same verses that I was teaching on before, but it wasn't producing anything. It was just like nothing was happening. And I, I'd run out of steam. And then I'd go hear Kenneth Copeland. I'd get fired up and I'd come back for a week or two to be good. And that happened so many times that I predicted it was going to happen. I knew it was going to happen. That for a week or two, man, there'd be an anointing on what I was teaching and people would be set free and then there wouldn't be. And I'd have to go back and get another fix. And Kenneth had taught on these exact passages of Scripture. And Jamie and I, this is right after I got married, Jamie and I were studying this and it's just like, boom, a light came on. That the reason I only endured for a time was because I didn't have root in myself. I was preaching Kenneth Copeland's revelation it wasn't my revelation. And you know, to this day, most people don't know that Kenneth Copeland was ever an influence in my life. And it's because of this exact passage in his own teaching. He was teaching about how you can't sit there and quote and say, Kenneth Copeland says, it needs to be, what did God say? And I made a decision that night. Jamie and I made a decision says, we had never again will have to say so-and-so said. I may hear somebody say something, but I'm going to take it and meditate on it until it becomes mine. It is not going to be somebody else said this. It's going to be God told me. Right. And I made a decision right then that, man, I am going to get rooted. It's going to get rooted in me. You know, when I was in the sixth grade, I got in trouble for talking in class. And the uh, teacher, it was a male teacher, he put me right in front of his desk so that he could watch me and uh, control me. And anyway, he put uh, a seed in two terrariums and these terrariums were about this tall. And uh, he put a tomato seed in each one of the terrariums. They had the identical light, the identical heat. Everything was identical except he put one inch, maybe two inches worth of dirt in one terrarium. And then in the other one, he put about nearly 12 inches worth of dirt in it. And then he planted those seeds. And every day he would have me, you know, water those plants and stuff. So they were all getting exactly the same thing. And the one, guess which one sprouted first? The one in the shallow soil. It looked like that it was actually doing better. The other one didn't even sprout. It was still underground. But the one in the shallow soil, it sprouted. And that thing probably grew a foot tall before the other one ever came out of the ground. And it looked like the one in the short soil, little soil, was doing better, but it had to put all of its growth into what was above the ground because it didn't have any room for its roots. And it just expended itself and it didn't have the root system to be able to support it. And within a short period of time, that thing turned white, totally white and shriveled up and died about the time that the other one had just barely broken the ground. And that second seed began to grow and we had to stake it and that thing produced tomatoes and all of this. And I learned right there that you know what? That the vast majority of growth happens underground before all of this other stuff happens. And if you don't have a root system, you can't support the growth that comes above ground. And this is where so many people are. They get excited. Notice it says that they receive the word with gladness. They get excited, but they don't have any root in themselves. And they are living off other people's revelations. They got excited because somebody else said it and they could see the benefit in somebody else's life. But if it's not rooted in you, afflictions and persecutions are going to come for the word's sake. Note, man, there's, like I said, there's so much in this verse. I could preach on each one of these things for a long time. But afflictions and persecutions do not come to help you. 
They are not designed by God to be good for you. They come to steal away the seed, the word that's been sown in your heart. They come from the devil. And you are going to have afflictions and persecutions because we live in a fallen world. Satan comes against the word. He's going to try and steal the word. He could steal it from the first person because they didn't understand. The seed was just laying above the ground. But once you begin to get it on the inside of you, then he starts coming with afflictions and persecutions to steal that word from you. And the way that works is that when you start being persecuted, you start thinking about yourself and you start getting into pity and you start, uh, you know, being hesitant to say things and step out because of the criticism that might come your way. It diverts your attention away from the Word of God. And that's how Satan steals from you is through afflictions and persecutions. You know, when I first got started in the, in the ministry, like I said, I was in this Baptist church and man, people were criticizing me and I was struggling and dealing with, you know, I was an introvert Nobody likes rejection. If you lack rejection, something's wrong with you. God didn't make us for rejection. He made us for acceptance, for relationship. But rejection does come and you have to learn how to deal with it. And I was being, uh, you know, hurt by the things that people were saying. And because of it, it was stealing the word away from me. And I went to this meeting and a friend of mine, Joe Nay, the guy who got me started in ministry, he called me out in this meeting and he said, Andy, I see you like a runner on a track, one of these oval tracks, quarter mile deal. And he said, I see you like a runner on the track. And he says, you're leading the race. He says, you're running a good race. But the people in the grandstands are yelling at you and telling you that you're doing it all wrong. And he says, I see you get off the track and go up into the grandstands and argue with the spectators. And he says, even if you win the argument, you're going to lose the race he says, forget what people say, stay on track. Man, that has been a life changer for me. That was a word that I apply in my life constantly. This is what persecution is all about. It gets you, instead of preaching the word, instead of standing on the word, it gets you to justifying yourself, thinking about yourself, promoting yourself. And even if you win the argument, even if you justified yourself and proved that you were right, Satan's won because you aren't preaching the word anymore. You're justifying yourself. Anybody get what I'm talking about? Yes. You know, in our ministry back, I don't even know how many years ago, maybe five, 10 years ago or something, I had them come to me and they started showing me all these blogs that people had written about me. They showed me one that says, the most dangerous man in America. <laughs> and all these kind of things. And they started showing me these blogs about people saying eyes of the devil and all of this stuff. And, and they, they said, we got to do something about this. And I told them, I told them that story. And I said, look, I am not going to get in the grandstands and argue with the spectators. I said, I don't want anybody spending any of my effort and time trying to deal with this stuff. So that was the end of it. And then two or three months later, they came to me and they showed me more blogs and they showed me that there, I don't even remember because I didn't accept it, but they showed me that there's a way you can get in and you can stop these things that are written about you and you can keep people from seeing them and stuff. And before they even got through with the presentation, I said, look, I told you, we aren't going to spend one ounce of my money justifying me and trying to, to defend me. If I win, Satan still wins because I'm not preaching the gospel anymore. We're taking my resources to defend myself. That's right. And I just told him, I said, don't ever bring this up again or you will not be working here. And we do not spend any of my time defending me. It's not about me. Man, we are out to be planning the word of God. And you've got to understand this, that when you start getting the word and it starts to, you receive it with gladness, Satan is going to come against you with persecution. And the purpose of it is to get your attention away from the word, like the ground, giving nourishment to the word. Instead of you doing that now, you're thinking about yourself and thinking, how can I deal with this? And how could this person say this about me? What's the chaff to the wheat is what Jesus said. You just do what God called you to do and forget about persecution. Amen. Don't worry about it. The Bible says in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 12, Yea, all those who will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. 
If you aren't being persecuted, it's because you aren't living godly. If you live godly, you'll be persecuted. Persecution doesn't have to be physical where they put you in jail or beat you, although that's coming. It can be just people rolling their eyes at you, calling you a fanatic, thinking that you're crazy to leave all of this and go out there to Karis Bible College and just people criticizing you. That can be persecution. In some ways, that's even worse because it's more subtle. You know, if somebody comes and puts a gun to your head, you renounce the Lord or I'll kill you. That's pretty obvious. But just people criticizing you and thinking, are you crazy? Have you lost your mind giving up everything and moving out to Colorado? You may not recognize it. And so therefore that could be more damaging. But that's persecution. It's criticism just coming against the things that God has told you to do. And you have to get to a place where you just stay on track. You don't let afflictions and persecutions come against you. Once you begin to understand things properly, did you know that actually when people persecute you, it's, it's a good sign. The Lord said, rejoice when they say all manner of evil against you uh, falsely for my sake. Rejoice, shout and leap for joy because great is your reward in heaven. Paul said in Philippians chapter three that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings. Paul longed for the fellowship of God's sufferings. That's a little hard for some people to understand, but you know, after a while you get to where I can stand persecution, but I can't stand to be ignored. If I'm ignored, that means I didn't minister properly. I can't guarantee that everybody's going to receive what I say, but I can guarantee that if I minister properly, there will either be a revival or a riot, but there won't be indifference. If a person is indifference, indifferent to what I'm saying, then something didn't go right. I can stand to be persecuted. That means I hit a nerve. Amen. It's like you throw a rock into a pack of dogs. The one that yelps the loudest got hit. <laughs> when somebody goes to persecuting you, they're under conviction. God is dealing with them and I, that's okay. I, that's fine. But man, people ignoring me is what bothers me. That means I'm not ministering right because Jesus had a revival or a riot everywhere he went. Yeah. You've just got to get to a place that you receive the truth from God's word and you do not let anybody sway you from it. And you know, in one sense, it's easy when people come out against you that you don't know and stuff, but when people that you know and love come out and criticize you, that's kind of hard because you, you really long for their acceptance. And uh, God, will, I mean, the devil will use personal friends, family and things like this to come out against you. And in a way it's understandable because God didn't talk to them. He, to he spoke to you. He told you to do something. And so it's understandable why they aren't excited about it because he hadn't told them about it. But you can't let anybody, you have to get to a place to where it says in Romans chapter three, verse four, let God be true and every man a liar. You have to get to a place to where God, if you told me to do this, I'll do it. If it hair lips ever devil in hell, I'm going to do it. There is no turning back. I'm not going to look to the right or to the left. What does God's word say? And until you get that focused on it and refuse to allow other people to influence you, sway you in any way, then Satan will hinder the word and it won't produce and it won't bear fruit as long as you're letting afflictions and persecution bother you. Notice it says that they are offended. The word offended doesn't mean that you've totally rejected it. It just means that you've been hurt. It means that you no longer have that same level of enthusiasm and zeal about it. You've just been offended. You could take a truth on healing and you could have the truth and believe that God wants you well, but then people begin to criticize you and say, well, if God wants you well, then what happened to this person? Why did they die? Are you saying that I'm of the devil because I'm not healed and people will throw all of this stuff at you and you don't have to quit believing that it's God's will to heal everybody, but you just get offended to where you're afraid to say things. You are uh, tentative about it. You aren't bold. You aren't speaking the truth because you're afraid that you're going to be criticized over it. And you know what? You will not bear fruit in that area. It'll keep the word from working in your life. You get to a place where you're uh, in finances. 
to where you know that it's God's will for you to prosper, but you know you're going to be criticized that if you sit there and tell people that you're going to be prospered, they're going to say you're one of those health wealth preachers. Well, that's better than being a doubt unbelief preacher, <laughs> poverty preacher. But anyway, because somebody's going to criticize you, just get offended. Just get to where you aren't bold, where you aren't speaking with confidence and authority, and it'll keep the Word of God from germinating and releasing its power in your life. You don't have to reject it. You just get offended. And see, that's where I was when I would go here, Kenneth, and then I'd come back and for a week or two, man, I was bold. But then after all of the criticism and stuff, I would be preaching the exact same thing, saying the same words, but in my heart, I was afraid. Persecution, it had an effect on me, and I wasn't bold saying the truth. And because of it, I wasn't getting the same results. You have to get to where you have root in yourself and you do not let afflictions and persecutions affect you any at all. You know, we've had people here that God spoke to them and told them to move to a foreign country. We've got some people right now that are <coughs> in Iran or excuse me, I guess they're in Jordan right now learning the language, but they're going into Iran. They have to go in covertly and things like this. And you know, it's just awesome to have God speak to you and tell you what he wants you to do with your life and to follow him. But there's people criticizing them. Now, don't you realize how dangerous it is? This man's taking his wife over there and there's people criticizing them and stuff. And I tell you, if, that ever, if you get to where you start considering things like that, then it'll stop the Word of God from working. We've had other people that were, you know, called to go on a foreign mission field. Maybe it wasn't as dangerous, but yet the parents of this couple were saying, what about my grandkids? I'm not going to see my grandkids and stuff like this. And they go to criticizing them. If you, if God speaks to you, but somebody else's opinion is influencing you and you have any reservation, you have any uh, questions about it because you're worried about what are the parents going to think? What are the grandparents going to think? What is this? What is my church going to think? Or if, if any of those things happen, then you're letting affliction and persecution steal the word from you. You need to be to a place to where, you know what, if God tells you to do something, you'll just do it and let the chips fall where they may. Now that doesn't mean that you aren't necessarily, I mean, that you're insensitive and you aren't aware that maybe the parents aren't gonna be able to see their kids. And so you tell them, look, we're gonna Skype, we'll do whatever we can, we'll come back, but we will obey God. I'm not saying you be mean to people and stuff like that, but you have to get to a place to where you have root. That seed has been sown in you and you recognize that the most valuable thing you will ever get in your life is a word from God. And you get a seed and you plant it in your heart and man, you protect that against everything that comes against it. Nothing is going to take your attention away from the word of God. Nothing. Absolutely nothing. And until you do that, then you aren't having root in yourself. And I see this all the time. People that get excited over the word and if there was no opposition and if nobody ever criticized them and if everything just worked perfectly, everything would be great. But they have no root in themselves. They can't endure. You know, when I was a little kid, we lived in a place where we had 23 pecan trees in our yard. And uh, this, these pecans would fall off the trees and then they would get down in the ground and they'd sprout and come up and we would have had 100 pecan trees if we didn't pull them up. So anyway, it was my job to pull up these pecan trees before they begin to grow. And being a typical kid, I didn't want to go out and pull up these pecan trees. So anyway, I'd wait until they got this high and my parents could see them as they drove into the place and they'd tell me and I'd have to go out. And I learned this, that if you wait until a pecan tree gets that tall, gets a, a foot tall, it's got three feet of roots. There is more growth underground than there is above ground. And if I would go out when they were just like this tall, you could just grab them and pull them out of the ground and it was over. But if you wait until they got that tall, you had to go get a shovel to dig them up. And the Lord reminded me of that, that the majority of the growth is underground. Matter of fact, here's a, this is a, in Mark chapter four also, this is a verse that the Lord used. I can tell you the exact day this happened. It was the day after I arrived in Vietnam. And the very first day in Vietnam, they, they made everybody go through the gas chamber. 
and they gave us CS gas. And I won't go into all of the gory details, but in basic, I had a very bad experience with CS gas. It nearly killed me. And I mean, I hated that CS gas. And when they said they were going to run us through a gas chamber, I prayed and said, oh God, I'll do anything. Get me out of this. And so at breakfast, they asked for volunteers. And you never volunteer for anything in the army. That's just, you're just dumb if you do. But I figured if they used me for target practice, it would be better than going through CS gas. So I volunteered and it turned out what they wanted me to do was to guard the barracks while all of the other uh, soldiers went through the gas chamber. And so I just laid on my bunk while everybody else was being gassed. It was awesome. <laughs> and I was reading this exact passage of scripture in Vietnam, my first full day in Vietnam, in Mark chapter four, verse 30. Wherein two shall we liken the kingdom of God or with what comparison will we compare it? It is like a grain of mustard seed, which when it is sown in the earth is less than all the seeds that be in the earth. But when it is sown, it groweth up and becometh greater than all herbs and shooteth out great branches so that the fowls of the air may lodge under the shadow of it. And I was reading that and I remember laying on that cot thinking, God, this is what I want. I want to reach out. I want you to use me to touch people all over the world. And I was envisioning this huge tree, you know, with all of these branches that, you know, it just, it was an awesome looking tree. And I said, that's what I want to be. I want to be this mature Christian that can reach people and touch people all over the world. And the Lord spoke to me and he said, if I was to grant your request right now and make you this huge tree that spreads spread out all over the earth, he says, your root is about that deep. And he says, the first bird to land on a branch would knock the whole tree over. <laughs> Boy, that was a word picture for me. And God spoke to me right then. And he says, you forget about the growth above ground. You just put the seed in your heart and you let the seed take root and all of this other stuff will come as a result. And you know, that has been a direction for me the rest of my life. That's been, I don't know, 40 something years ago. And this is basically all I've done is just take the seed and put it in my heart and meditate on him. And I've been growing below the surface in my root system. And then the growth above ground that people can see, that's just the byproduct. You don't have to worry about the growth. You don't have to worry about your ministry. You don't have to worry about God's will coming to pass. If you'll just take the seed and keep it in your heart and protect it and let the, give it the nourishment that it needs. Well, that's powerful. And I'm telling you, most people, they want the visible stuff. They want the outward manifestation, but they don't want to get alone with God. And they don't want to spend time in the Word. And they don't want to just study the Word. They want to do something that's visible. They want to be killing Goliath, but nobody wants to be faithful with just the lion and the bear on the backside of the desert. But see, it's in that private time. It's just between you and the Lord where this root really takes place in your life. And that determines how much growth you'll have above the, the soil. There's a special type of bamboo that I read about that for four years, all it does, or three years, all it does is produce one leaf about that big for three years. And then in the fourth year, that bamboo grows 18 something feet in one year. And people think, man, that was quick. No, it was four years worth of growth. You only saw the part above ground in one year and you think, man, that gr matter of fact, I figured up during a growing season, that means that that bamboo had to grow a quarter of an inch a day. You could nearly see the thing grow. And people think that's fantastic. That's what I want. But see, they don't want the three years of growth in the root system underneath the ground. Everybody's wanting these visible results. I want to see the blind eyes open. I want to see all of this. I want to go out and see the power of God flow through me. But are you taking the word of God and just putting it in your heart day and night? Are you letting what people say against you, criticize you? Is that occupying some of your thinking and taking away nourishment that could be given to the seed? Man, you got to go through all of these things. But I'm telling you, this has just transformed my life. These two parables that I've shared today have been life transforming for me. And everything that you see, everything that's above the ground that you can see came because of these truths 
and the time that I've spent alone with the Lord, just meditating in the Word and getting the Word in my life. And it's the exact same thing for you. And I want to encourage you. This is a valuable time in your life. And I know many of you are, you know, it's only the second, third day of school. You're already chomping at the bits. You're wanting to get out and do something. But you need to value this time. This is a special time that you're going to be sitting under the Word. We've added it up that if you were to take all of the years of experience of all of our instructors that we have here, just the ones that are on staff, paid instructors, that we have over a thousand years worth of experience that we're sharing with you. And you are going to be hearing things. I mean, this is awesome. Instead of you having to go out and learn everything by hard knocks, you're learning through me and through all of the other instructors and the good and the bad and the things that we've made mistakes in. And it's just going to be an awesome time of you taking truths, and, but you need to meditate in it. You need to give yourself wholly to these things in order for the Word to have its full impact in your life. And again, I want to commend you. This is awesome that you've made the commitment and that you've gone through all the things you've gone through in order to be here. I commend you for that. But you know what? Every year we'll have some people that are here physically, but mentally or emotionally, they're someplace else. They let other things distract them from what God's calling you to do. And I'm telling you, Satan's not going to roll over and play dead just because you're here. There will be afflictions and persecutions. You'll have people come against you. You'll have things happen. And he's going to try and steal the word. He's going to try and keep you from giving yourself totally to the word. But man, if you will just take advantage of this, I think that this is life transforming. I'd have loved to have had a Karis Bible College to go through when I was getting started. But man, there wasn't anything like this. I got started before Rhema started. And uh, I, just, I went through the school of hard knocks. And if you live through it, it makes a great testimony, but there's a better way. That's Karis. <laughs> Praise God. So I believe this is going to be really, really good for you. All right, we got six minutes left. Anybody got a question? Here's a little mic right here. If you've got a question or a comment on this, come up to this mic and uh, we'll take your questions. Twelve years ago, I started following you. And through watching you, God's changed my life. And I didn't go to church, but I received your word that you taught. I got it right the first time. Praise God. But I went out and I got to the place just by listening to you that I could lay hands on, lay, excuse me, lay hands on people and see them healed. Mm -hmm. And you know, not knowing the word like I should, persecutions had really jumped on me because I didn't know how to fight Satan off. I knew how to lay hands on people. I kept doing it, doing it even when I was bad off hurting in pain, and I come here with that same persecution. I've had you pray for me. Called prayer line, and never could receive it because I didn't have the word grounded in me. I could do the work, do the work that you taught me how to do, listen to you, but the persecution I couldn't get rid of. But since I've came here, just coming here, I am getting so much better off in my physical part. It's been Amen. and you just coming, taking that step in the move toward learning the word that God, that desire God put in my life. And that's so only been changed. three days. Three Think days. what it's going to be like after nine months. <laughs> Praise the Lord. And I want to get over this place where I have a hard time talking in front of people. You see how it's struggle. I struggle. Man, and I you, don't you like do it. a lot better than I did when I started. <laughs> Amen. That's awesome. <laughs> You know, one of the things that I've done to deal with persecution, and it's not something that you just get over it. It still doesn't bless me. If you were to come up to me today and say, I disagree with everything you said, and you start criticizing me, it's not going to bless me. If you like persecution, something's wrong with you. <laughs> I've actually met some people say, oh, it doesn't bother me, and they're just hardened. Well, you become hardened towards people, towards everything. You aren't supposed to be hardened. It, it should not bless you when people hate you and say bad things about you. So it's not just that you ever get over it and that you never have a problem with it, but you have to learn how to cast your care over on the Lord. And one of the things that's really helped me is to realize it's not me that they're persecuting. It's not me. I'm really a nice guy. <laughs> it's what I say. It's the fact that the Holy Spirit is touching them. They 
You know, it's like uh, if you have somebody in court who brings up damaging testimony, what they will try and do is discredit that witness. And if they can discredit and show that they have perjured themselves in the past, that they're a liar, they're a thief, all of it, well, then you can totally throw their testimony out and it has no effect because they are a discredited witness. And that's what people are doing. When, the, when you say this God's will to heal and stuff and they don't receive that, they will come out and attack you because if they can discredit you and make you look bad, well, then the, the impact of what you said won't bother them anymore. So they'll attack you. And it really has helped me just to recognize that people aren't mad at me. They're mad at who I represent. They're mad resisting this because they had somebody die and they're thinking that, well, if I say it's God's will for everybody to be healed, then you're saying that this person was somehow or another not a godly person, which is not what I'm saying at all. But anyway, they just, they will come out and attack you and begin to start saying things against you. We see this in politics all of the time. I mean, man, people are just slandering other people. Instead of saying, I disagree with what you're saying and here's what I believe, Instead, they come out and use names to call people and they, it's just terrible the way that people do this. But this is the way our world is. And so anyway, it helps to understand that they aren't persecuting you. And this is what Paul talked about. He says, I long for the fellowship of your sufferings. Once you understand that it's not you that they're persecuting, they're actually persecuting Jesus. They're still persecuting Jesus. Paul said, I'm filling up that which is behind in the sufferings of Christ. And Jesus is still suffering. You know, when he met Paul on the Damascus road, he said, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? He didn't say, why do you persecute my people? He says, why do you persecute me? He takes it personally. When people come out against you for what you've stood for for the Lord, when you've taken a stand on the word or in something, they're persecuting Jesus. And you may be the one they're talking to. You may be the one that's getting caught in the middle, but they're actually persecuting Jesus. And Paul knew that. And because of it, man, God will supernaturally Amen. comfort you. It's kind of like if, you know, you're married and you have a fight or something and then you make up. It's so nice when you make up that you nearly enjoy the fight because you know <laughs> that on the other side, you're gonna, it's going to be awesome. Amen. <laughs> Well, it's kind of like that. I'm persecuting. I'm not enjoying the persecution, but I'm sure looking forward to the comfort of the Lord coming in <laughs> and Him encouraging me. And that's what Paul was talking about. He was longing for the fellowship of His suffering. I believe that God is sowing seed in your life and praise God, you're going to receive it and have root in yourself and you're going to bring forth fruit a hundredfold in the name of Jesus. Amen. Praise God. <laughs> 